back. Today we're gonna review a tic-tac-toe program. This is one I found just Googling around on GitHub and it looked like a good one to review. Here we have an object-oriented tic-tac-toe program in Java. It's a showcase of various object-oriented principles. To run the game, just type Maven execute Java. This is great. We know exactly how to run the program once we download it. So let's go ahead and try it. I could clone it or I could just download it and run it. Let's try cloning it. I want it to be in my desktop, so I'm gonna put it there. Let's actually open the folder. Here, there's all this stuff. We have all the GitHub things here. Source, main, Java, com, GitHub. And there's the files. Let's open this up in IntelliJ so we can click around, see what it's doing. And while it's opening up, let's actually run it in the way the person suggests. So we'll CD into the directory. And this has the palm file, so I should be able to run that command right here. Maven execute. Great. Okay, there we go. Build failure. Let's open it up in IntelliJ and see what's going on. Let's try running it from here. So I'm in my IDE. I'm just gonna press this play button and it should run the program. And an error from a print statement. All right, so I figured out why it wasn't working. It's because the console, when you run it in an IDE, I guess it's not recognizing this as a console, but if we run it over here and we do that Maven exec Java, it works. Yeah. All right, so it looks like here's the board and I could run it in this terminal, but I kind of want to run it in the other terminal. I'm X, enter your move X. Um, X, Y. So this must mean we put in zero, one, or whatever our position is. Oh, but is it one based counting or zero based counting? Well, we'll find out. We'll do one, one and hope for the best. Oh, we got an error. Oh no. It did not like this. Parse int, parse int. Well, let's try a different type of input. Let's try one, one. Exactly how it's Nope, okay. If we look at that feedback section, input error handling is not the main focus of this exercise. So that may stay as basic as it is right now, but your users matter. If I can't use this program easily, that's a problem. But as long as I'm not giving feedback about that, it's all welcome. So let's see what exactly is going on when we run this. So the first part that's run is this main that's using a new game builder. So it's using some kind of builder pattern. We're building the game and then we play the game. So I don't really care how the game's built. I care about how we're playing it. So there's this board that is a board object and board is an interface that has a player view, like different player views and a few methods. We also have an array of players. This feels a little weird because only two people can play tic-tac-toe, so it kind of makes sense to have a player one and a player two. I get where they're coming from of like, it would be nice if we had this really broad abstract class that's like a game and it could have any number of players, it can have any kind of board and all of the logic of the game is abstracted. The problem is, is here we have tic-tac-toe logic. And so this idea of the board containing the row or the board being full, this is something that's specific to tic-tac-toe. So this really should be a tic-tac-toe game and be a little bit more specific to tic-tac-toe with a player one, a player two. So there aren't 10 people playing tic-tac-toe. So contains row must mean has a free space or mm, I, that name is a little weird. Okay, um, true if the board contains a full horizontal, vertical or diagonal row of the same mark. So contains row is like, has someone won the game? Is the board full? Meaning all the spaces probably are taken up. Meaning, so if the game is in place, like have the next player make a move. And that next player is determined by who, what turn it is. And so it looks like X's always go first or the first player always goes first. And then when we increment the turn, if we mod it by two, that's gonna give us the other player. So this is like some nifty logic here, pretty cool. But again, it assumes that there are two players. If there are not two players, like say this player's array has 10 people in it, 
this will only go between player one and two. So we could change this to be a player's dot size length and it would be a little bit more dynamic here and that whenever we increment the turn, we're gonna continue to increment it and give everyone a turn in the array until it's that first player's turn again. All right, so we've opened it up here in the GitHub desktop. We can see all these changes. These are changes we did not make. These are just things that probably should be added to the Git ignore, but they haven't because there is, is there a Git ignore? There is not. So that's something we should also add, along with this next player thing. So what we can do is maybe add that get ignore for first, so that way these little changes do not get added to our code base. We only want to add the good stuff, and the good stuff would be this change where we're actually changing the implementation. So let's create a new branch. We're gonna call it feature add get ignore let's create it we're gonna leave the current changes on the master branch to add the get ignore we'll just go to our terminal nano get ignore and this is how we can create a quick file inside of this we're gonna put the changes we do not want to track so let's just find a get ignore for Java and we'll just copy it so we'll write that out here it is, it's a tracked change. I like that git message, create git ignore. So we're just gonna commit that. We'll publish it. I don't have write access. Oh no. Okay, we'll fork it. I would like to contribute to their repository. And so what this has done is they've created a GitHub repo, essentially, on my side. Here it is, Blondie writes tic-tac-toe. And right now it's even with the master branch, but we're gonna create a pull request so that we can add these changes onto this guy. So now we're gonna create a pull request. With the pull request, we are requesting Rob here to pull down our changes, test them, and then if they're okay, approve them and merge them into the master branch. And so now the master branch has our cool new feature of having the get ignore. And there's the file we added. So let's go ahead and create that. I cannot merge it because I do not have write access. So maybe one day Rob will go and merge it in. So what about that other change? Let's go back to master. We'll restore, ah, uh, discard this change. We will restore our old changes. We're not gonna include these ones, discard. And that will automatically be done by our git ignore once that gets merged in. This is a change and we kind of want it to be on a different branch because it's unrelated to that git ignore change. And so here we're gonna say, this is actually kind of a bug, accommodate more players. So we'll create this branch. We're gonna bring our changes to this new branch. We're gonna publish it and then this is publishing to my version. We can see this accommodate more players branch. We are gonna do, oh. So I created the branch, but I forgot to commit the change. Fix next player for multiple players. There we go, that feels good enough. We're gonna push our change up, and now it's letting us create that pull request. So we're gonna create the pull request of getting this accommodate more players into the master branch. So there we go, now we have another pull request. So it's taking it from our branch and we're gonna merge it into the main primary branch. Going back to the code, now let's get back on the main branch and see what else we can find out about this code. So before we were in the game class, so the next player returns a player. So the make move method must be in this player class. Let's go into that. I think it's doing some indexing, which is why I can't click into it right now. Make move. Great, it's an interface. Okay, so probably the human player is where this is actually defined. Okay, so that was a little strange. Now the syntax highlighting is back, and all I did was exit it and re-import it, and that seemed to have worked. One thing I think they're doing pretty good here is they have two different types of players. They have this human player, the random player, that we'll take a look at a little bit later, but they both implement this player interface, and so that, is a pretty good design using interfaces so that way 
when a given function needs to return a player, they can just use player and not have to specify whether it's a human player or a random player. They both share that make move function. So I think that's pretty good. But what is actually making the move here? It looks like you have this UI draw that shows the board, which is pretty good, but it's this views.show here and this ask for move that's actually letting the player make the move. And we have another interface, great. Uh, so this interface has an interface within it, this select from. What we can do is actually we can see what is the implementation of the select from. We're getting a little interface crazy here. An interface is good when you have multiple things that use the interface, but if there's only one thing that uses the interface, it's not so helpful. You should just have the class and forget about the interface. But here we are, ask for move. This is where our input is being parsed by the algorithm. And so they're using this integer.parseInt. We were getting errors before because we had those parentheses around our implementation. So if we don't have, if we remove those parentheses, we should be in pretty good shape. All we have to do is the number, comma, and then another number. And we get an error. And I think it's because that target directory has not been created yet, but when we press the play button in the IDE, it actually creates that target directory for us. So once that's created, we can just run the program. So when it's saying it can't find that class, it's the jar file has not been created yet. We create the jar file by running it in the IDE that does some build process, and then we can do that name and execute and actually execute the program. Now we can run it, we're in good shape. So we'll put an X at one one, We'll put an O. They have the X, Y, which is kind of nice. And so your X is like horizontally, where are you going? And then the Y is like vertically, where are you going? So we'll do zero, zero. We'll do one, one. Oh, it throws an exception. <laughs> so this is one way to handle an error is to just have this exception and say, cannot mark cell at one, one and completely exit the program. But this is actually kind of a common issue where someone would try to mark a cell that's already there. So instead of throwing this exception, while I like the fact they're using exceptions, since it's like a common thing that a user would do, you could just do a print statement and then ask the user to try again. So let's try this again. We're gonna try to make X win, and we're just gonna put things at random spaces, and X wins, and it's just a build success. There's no good job. We put our X in that one position at two zero, and the game just ends. We just build success. It would be really nice if we had like a congratulations message. Now what happens if X and O tie? So what if they, the board gets filled and they both tie? Well, nothing happens. It still says build success. We also don't get to see the board once it's finally done and created. Would love to see the board once it's created and done and has everything filled out or just to see which party won or if it was a tie to see that final product that would be kind of nice if you have code that you want me to review let me know down in the comments you can also email it to me blondiebytes at gmail.com i'll see you next time happy coding